I think we can probably make a start now. Well, welcome everyone to this talk with Nicola Giza presenting time in physics and intuitionistic mathematics. And in case you're joining us for the first time this week, just a very quick reminder that the following talk is part of Numerous University, an interdisciplinary conference about the nature of numbers organized by the Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research. And this session is going to be moderated by my colleague Carlos here. So Carlos, go ahead. Thanks very much, Laura. Uh, well, first of all, welcome everyone to our third day of talks. Um, and indeed, I am delighted to introduce uh, Nicola Giza as our first speaker of the day. Nicola is a, is a physics professor at the University of Geneva and a member of the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology. Originally from a background in theoretical physics, uh, Nicola has worked in both the foundational and applied ends of the intellectual spectrum, particularly focusing on quantum physics and quantum technologies. Now, for you to get a sense of why we consider Nicola as a good example of the kind of intersectional profile that we are after in the Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, bear in mind that at one end of the spectrum, he has written impactful papers on the, on the philosophical foundations of quantum mechanics, and on the other, he's co-founded IDQ, a company leading the quantum communications industry. But of course, most relevant for us today are Nicholas's ideas about time and intuitionistic mathematics and physics, both topics that perfectly align, of course, with the scope of his conference, Numerous Numerosity. Although we don't often think of them in that light, physical theories are quite dependent on tradition and community folklore. And I'm sure Nicholas's proposals will help us rethink many of our preconceptions about what it means to make a scientific prediction or what constitutes a sexual model of reality. So with, without further ado, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Um, can I put that on the side? Okay. Okay, so um, do you see my screen now? Yes, we can see that perfectly. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so probably you also noticed that I'm actually lying down in my armchair. Uh, this is because uh, four weeks ago I got a new knee a prothesis and I still need to have my, my leg a bit high. So I'm indeed lying down. Okay, so yeah, indeed. So I want to tell you about intuitionistic mathematics. I imagine you also see my point. Let's have it like that. Yeah, so here we talk, I mean, at least half of the presentation will be about this intuitionistic mathematics. Mm -hmm. But let me start, uh, and maybe also let me just start by telling you what is the main message, I mean, uh, take home message is that one. Real numbers are not really real. Of course, I explained that. Uh, but let me start with motivations. So as uh, Carlos said, I'm a, a physicist. I worked, uh, still work mostly in quantum physics, from foundation to applications, uh, broad spectrum. Everything is quite fascinating here. Um, and so my motivation is about time, or more precisely time in physics or the passage of time. And uh, of course, passage of time, like the concept of numbers, covers everything from physics to philosophy, biology, geology, mathematics, and so on. Even mathematics, we'll see that there is time in mathematics. Um, but of course, also the kind of answers that I'm looking after and uh, that physicists would be interested is not so much uh, a philosophical uh, description of the feeling of the passage of time. It should be something that can be used to make predictions, to make physics, to develop physical models of reality. So it has to be kind of concrete and uh, kind of mathematical. But anyway, if we start with the idea that we all feel the passage of time, uh, we can also turn to art. And so here is, for instance, one painting, which I, I like quite a lot, and which I think is a good description of the passage of time. Probably most of us, and certainly most of my physics colleagues, would not consider that as a description or an illustration of the passage of time. They would have a clock or something like that, or a periodic event, maybe with waves, but I think here we see more that there is really something happening, something that is ongoing, that is developing, and where 
surprises exist. So let me just continue with this uh, introduction. So what is time? Of course, no one knows, but uh, as uh, San Augustine famously uh, wrote, if nobody asks me, I know, but if I were deserve, deserves to explain it to one who would ask me plainly, I do not know. Okay, doesn't help too much. Um, a physicist would probably say that time is what ideal clocks measure. Okay, that's almost a tautology because what is an ideal clock? An ideal clock is something that measures time. So of course, time is what is measured by an ideal clock. Um, but what is a, a clock? Well, if you ask again an artist, you will have something like here on the right-hand side. So these kind of clocks, which are probably closer to our feeling, or at least to my feeling of the passage of time. That doesn't mean that clocks, these kind of good clocks, uh, don't show something which is also time-like. Uh, maybe a good way of uh, naming this kind of uh, time is uh, Parmenides or geometric time, when what matters is being. And indeed, I mean, time in physics is this parameter T that you find in Newton's equation of classical mechanics, or also that you find in a Schrodinger equation for quantum dynamics, or is also this geometrical uh, uh, characteristic of space-time that you find in, uh, in relativity, both special and general relativity. But so this is a kind of time which certainly makes sense and is relevant to physics. But as you have already written here, I don't think this is ex exhausting time. Um, and I think that an essential aspect of time is that there is a time before and a time after an event. For instance, a time before and after I made an important decision. This idea of before and after events, decisions, something that happens, and especially something that is surprising, something that is kind of new, something that was not foreseen or was not necessary. And then we really have the feeling that something has happened and that time has passed between before and after these non-necessary events. So here maybe I like to really uh, emphasize that for me, deterministic creation is not real creation because whatever novelty arises is really just an unfolding of what came before. I'll, I'll certainly come back to that uh, and explain more about that. And I guess a better, ah, yeah, then, okay, instead of creation, we could also say events, deterministic events are not real events, so are certainly not new events. They were already there if they are deterministic. So a better illustration of the passage of time is, I believe, with these kind of sand clocks. You may say that sand clock is essentially the same as this kind of more modern clock, except that the more modern clock is much more accurate. But on the long term, there's also some diffusion, some irreversibility and dissipation in all these clocks. But here it is on a time scale that we can really uh, apprehend. So if we think of two of these grain, uh, sand grains here on the top or near the top, which one is going to be the first to pass here to the lower part? Well, my physicist colleagues would say, oh, that's all determined by the initial condition and by the dynamical laws. But you don't need to think like that. Anyway, there's no way of really uh, predicting which sand grain is going to pass first. So there could be also some really creative uh, events here. And it's really the accumulation of all these little events, one sand clock, a sand, uh, a sand grain passing uh, first and, and so on. So a second concept of time is the accumulation of little events. And if these events are not necessary, are not deterministic, then I would call that Heraclitus creative time, when what matters is change. 
So certainly this, uh, this different concept of time, different from determinism is also uh, relevant, is probably closer to our feelings and is so far not really central in physics, but that's maybe something which is missing. So why I am so much interested in time as a physicist? Let's go back to what is actually physics and what do physicists do? Well, physicists produce models of reality and obviously these models should be as faithful as possible. Now, what does faithful mean? Well, first of all, it should give correct empirical predictions. And maybe many physicists would stop here, but I think this is only half of what a good physical model of reality should do. Another aspect of a good physical model is that it would allow us humans to tell stories about how nature does it. So a typical example is a, is a physical model of the tides uh, and the story then goes, there is the moon somewhere and the moon attracts the water and that leads to the tides. Uh, so in these kind of stories, you don't have equations, but you have time. The moon is there and then it attracts the, the water. And without this timing, you don't have really stories. So there's no way to tell a story without the passage of time. As Yuval Dolev, a philosopher in Jerusalem, wrote, uh, to think of an event is to think of something in time. So to tell stories, we need time. And maybe I could here paraphrase Rable and say that science without time is but ruin of intelligibility. So here is another illustration of the, the, the importance of time. And here my colleagues, physicists, would agree that there is a tension, to see the least, between, let's say, relativity, uh, in which everything is fixed since ever and forever, with this block universe view, where the now is completely arbitrary, uh, while we all know that the now plays a very speci special role in our lives. And on the other side here, you have, which is more my speciality, so a quantum uh, uh, here, a quantum uh, random number generator where you have a light source that produces photons that hit a beam splitter, which are followed, which is followed by two detectors, so two single photon detectors, and one we label zero, the other one we label one, and then we get a string of random bits. And here, these random bits, according to quantum mechanics, could go on with bell inequalities, but I don't want to do all that. But there is really new information that gets created as time passes. So here we have new information. Here, everything is fixed. So of course, there is attention. And since uh, I was also introduced as a practical uh, applied physicist or an engineer, let me just show you how far with IDQ, this company that was mentioned, engineers have been able to put all that into a millimeter size uh, chip, which is actually integrated in this uh, smartphone. Okay, in this case, it's a Samsung smartphone. And um, so some people actually mostly in Asia so far have a smart, uh, have a, a random number generator in their pocket which I not, oh, it's maybe not super fundamental, but somehow makes it uh, more real in some sense. Maybe not the deepest sense, but certainly quantum mechanics makes new information very concrete. And here is what happens if you stick to the left side here, this block universe, which many physicists do. So here is something that uh, uh, Sabine, uh, uh, Hasenfelder uh, did in, in one of her YouTube. She also has a very nice book and many of her YouTube uh, videos are, are super nice. But this one uh, I find shocking and I want to tell you uh, why. So in this video, Sabine says, you are here to hear what science says. Oh, very good. The entire story of the universe was already determined at the Big Bang. We are just watching it playing out. And she even goes on, we know the future is determined by the present. 
If you think otherwise, you are denying scientific evidence. Wow, that's very strong. So I'm probably, according to Sabine, denying scientific evidence. Uh, so according to this view, this block universe view, everything is like on this bobbin, a bobbin uh, from, a, from a movie. And the bobbin is already there since the Big Bang, let's say, since ever. And all what we're doing is watching it. It's like when you go to the movie. And if you go to the movie, you are a spectator. And indeed, if the movie is bad, then time passes slowly. If the movie is good, time passes much faster, as we all know. The problem is, if, if you apply this kind of, of uh, 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 analogy, uh, not to a movie, but to the entire universe, the entire universe, then there are no spectators. We are inside the universe. We are inside the bobbin. We are like the character on this bobbin. So the reality is that there are no spectators for whom the time passes. They are only the characters on the bobbin. And for these characters, no time passes. Everything is there since ever and forever. So you see that when you conclude that time is just an illusion, of course, free will also, and so on. So it has huge implications. Is that really necessary? So here I'll come now to intuitionist mathematics, and we try to give you first a very first encounter. So this is mathematics. How can time enter mathematics? So numbers, mathematics maybe starts at least with arithmetic, and you have numbers. And um, numbers are there to count. So how can it be that most of these numbers, and most of them are real numbers, the real numbers for those who would know is these numbers where you have a dot, and after the dot you have digits, and actually you have an endless series of digits. And most of these numbers are actually not computable. Let's try to define some very simple integer. Actually, it would even be just bits, zero or ones. Let me start with the following one, n1. And by definition, n1 is equal to zero if every even integer between 4 and 10,000 is the sum of two prime numbers, and n1 equal 1 otherwise. So most likely, most of you don't know the value of n1. But certainly also most of you have no difficulty understanding that n1 has a value. n1 has a determined value. And probably many of you could just go to your computer and just compute it. You just you know, look one after the other, all these 10,000 numbers, actually half of them, because only the even integers and check whether they are sum of two primes. That can be done on, on a very simple computer. That's fine. So we don't know it, but it can be found. Now, N2 is very similar, but this time I look between four and a huge number. So here, while no one is going to jump on his computer to compute the value of N2, because it would take more than your lifetime, and it would be super boring, uh, so no interest. But still, everyone would understand that it's just a matter of running a pretty simple algorithm for a long time, a long but finite time. So there is an, a, a finite algorithm, which for sure, after a finite time, gives us the value of N2. Consequently, N2 has a value. The value of N2 is determined, even if we don't know it. Let's continue. One last one, N3. And here it is for every integer large, larger than four without an upper bound. And this actually, so n3 equals zero would be, uh, is equivalent to Goldbach, uh, Goldbach uh, conjecture, which is an old uh, conjecture in, uh, in arithmetics. Now here you see there's a big difference because even if you have a super powerful computer, that doesn't give you an algorithm which is going to determine the value of n3 in a finite time. You know, you, after a century, maybe you still don't know the answer. And then 
So does N3 have a value? Is the value of N3 determined? For sure, there is no known finite method to compute N3. But nevertheless, if you are a student in mathematics and have been selected to be allowed to study mathematics, then you know very well that in order not to fail an exam, you have to claim that N3 has a determined value because of the law of the excluded middle. You know, if it is not N3 equal zero, it has to be the other one. So it has to have a value. Well, here comes now intuitionist mathematics. If the exam is in intuitionist mathematics, then the student should answer that the value of N3 is indeterminate. So there's an additional possibility here, an indeterminate value can be zero, can be one, can be indeterminate. And consequently, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. And indeed in intuitionist mathematics, like in most uh, constructive mathematics, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. So this is already shocking, at least for, for, for most mathematicians, um, and certainly for most physicists or people who just use mathematics without too, too much thinking. But it's not even the end here. There's something more. Of course, this Goldbach conjecture could someday be proven by some clever mathematician. And that means that someday the value of N3 may evolve. After this finding, N3 may have a value now. Either someone found a counterexample and N3 equal one or N3 equal zero is proven. And so the, the number, this is a number. And this number may evolve, may change its value over time. It may evolve from indeterminate to determinate. So you start think, feeling here that even in mathematics, at least in some form of mathematics, uh, time enters. So let's look at uh, this intuitionist uh, uh, viewpoint. So uh, here I start with a quote by uh, Karl Posse, again, a philosopher from uh, Jerusalem who wrote, we humans have finite memories, finite attention span, and finite lives. So we can fully grasp only finitely many finite sized pieces of a compound thing. There is no infinite helicopter which would allow us to survey the entire terrain or to tell how things will look at the end of time. You know, we only see part of it. We are like ants walking on the floor. Or also what Eric Bishop, a famous uh, constructive mathematician wrote, the classicist wishes to describe God's mathematics. The constructivists to describe the mathematics of finite being, man's mathematics for short. Constructive mathematics does not postulate a pre-existing universe with objects lying around waiting to be collected and grouped into sets like shells on the beach. So not everything is pre-existing. Things are happening, get created as time passes. Very different view of mathematics. And Brouwer, Brouwer is really the father of intuitionistic mathematics. He has it like that. Nature simply has not yet fully determined all objects. What I'm going to do tomorrow is not yet fully determined. But also numbers are not yet fully determined. And this can be compared, of course, to the uncertainty principle used in quantum mechanics. So that's the essence of intuitionism. And maybe many of you start to get worried, but how could there be things, including mathematical objects, including numbers that are not fully determined? Maybe to calm you a bit on calm your worries, let me state that with intuitionist mathematics, you can compute and prove theorems. You can, okay, you, you do that not always in the same way as in classical mathematics, maybe it's not always the same theorems. I will show you some examples of theorems that get slightly changed or that are a bit different, 
or even new. Uh, and also sometimes the proof technique may be different. But for sure, everything one can do on a classical computer and everything that, that we can predict in physics or in science, in bi biology, geology, you can always do it on a classical computer. And everything you can do on a classical computer can also be done with intuitionist mathematics. And all of physics, and here I could have written all of science, can be done. And there's an example which I like very much, climate physics. Of course, this is super timely. And how do the climate physicists do? We have a finite, huge but finite computers. And ideally, they should put as initial condition the, the temperature, pressure, and so on, everywhere on the globe. Of course, that would be too much, so they cannot put all that into their, their computers. So they use truncated numbers, and then they let the computer simulate future climate. But at some point, because the evolution of climate is uh, chaotic, they need more numbers. How do they do that? They add stochastic reminders. So they create new digits. So just to be able to continue the computation so that they can predict the climate in, in, a, in decades or 100 years. Uh, here you have a paper by uh, Tim Palmer on that. Uh, how can I get rid of this thing here? OK. So the mathematical language we speak, whether it is, for instance, classical mathematics or intuitionistic mathematics, has a huge influence on the worldview that physics presents to us. And the dependence of intuitionism on time is essential. So statements can become provable in the course of time and therefore might become intuitionistic valid while not having been so before, as you can find in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And so Brouwer, so the father of intuitionism, he introduced into his mathematics the concept of an ideal mathematician, sometimes he named it the creating subject, you know, the one who would solve this Goldbach conjecture, for instance, who continuously produce new information by solving mathematical conjectures. So Brouwer was a kind of uh, idealist or even maybe a, a, a solipsist. So not at all a physicist. Physicist, a kind of naive uh, realist. And the way I will present intuitionism will be without this ideal mathematician and I mo will motivate it by the physical concept of indeterminism or the passage of time. So it is very plausible that Brouwer would not have liked my presentation because I'm just a physicist and uh, okay, different, certainly a very different uh, worldview. And my main claim is that intuitionist mathematics is the natural mathematical tool to describe the passage of time. So first of all, that one can describe the passage of time and describe indeterminism in physics and that intuition is, is the appropriate tool. In some, some sort, some way, it's like derivative, which is certainly the natural tool to describe velocities. We need mathematical tools for velocities. We need mathematical tools for indeterminism and for the passage of time. Let me come to an example, a classical example of uh, a chaotic system. So it's a classical dynamical system, and most classical dynamical systems are chaotic, are of the form of this example. So here the, the state space is just a number between zero and one. And in one time step, you do the following, you first stretch it. That's why it is called the Baker map. You kind of stretch your stretch it and then you fold it back and this is described by this little equation, but more uh, easier is to write this X, which is labeling here the state, uh, which because it's a number between zero and one, it starts with a zero, then you have a dot, and then you have a series, and let's write it in bits, so in binary format, so these are not digits, but are bits, are just zero and ones. And now this, this transformation, which I showed you here, 
is just the following. The first bit drops out because of this folding. The second bit becomes the first one, the third bit becomes the second one, and so on. You just shift everything by one uh, place to the left. And then obviously, whether x lies on the left or, or right half after n steps depends on the nth initial bit. Yeah, because after uh, the, the, the nth bit, b, uh, b n, b index n, after n steps becomes the first one. And the, the first one decides or determines whether x lies on the left or on the right. And you can now interpret that this is the probability of rain. So being larger than one half means it's mostly rainy, smaller is mostly sunny. And then comes the central question. Um, is the millionth bit physically real? Or physically relevant. Let me really emphasize my question is not whether this billion for millions of bits can be measured. Of course, it cannot be measured. We don't have any uh, instrument to measure with such a precision. But is it physically real? Is this initial condition really there? And does it really determine the entire future? As okay, Sabine and many uh, would say, or is it actually? non-real, does it, it may be created as time passes, as you start to uh, understand. Okay. So let's look at typical real numbers, understand what typical real numbers are, according to classical mathematics. So actually, probably none of you has ever met a typical real number. Because all the numbers that you have met are maybe just a fraction, maybe even an integer, or maybe a screw root of two or pi. But all these numbers have a name. You've never met a number that has no name. Maybe the name is a bit complicated, but it has a name. The name maybe is actually an algorithm, finite algorithm, like a finite name. But actually, most of the real numbers the enormous vast majority, we have no names. We are not at all of that form. The bits of a typical real number have no structure. The bits are random, completely random, us random as quantum measurement outcomes. So actually, the best way to think of a typical real number is to have a random number generator. And you look what comes out of this random number generator, and this is a typical real number. And indeed, since there are only countably many names and algorithms, typical real numbers have to contain infinite Shannon information. And the fact that an, a single real number contains infinite uh, information has been okay noticed by many people, but uh, Emil Borel has uh, uh, illustrated that in the following nice way. With one real number, one can code the answers to all questions one can formulate in any human language. Of course, there are infinitely many questions, there are very many human languages. So to code the information to this infinite list of questions, you need to be able to code infinite information. And you can do that in a single real number. So you should now start feeling that these real numbers are maybe not that real. And according to uh, Grégory uh, Chatin, uh, the only good way of thinking of a typical real number is the unlimited string of outcomes of a true random number generator. <coughs> So this is not only one possibility to think of a typical real number, it's actually the only possibility. And when, for instance, physicists say, let x zero be a real number, denoting an initial condition, what we are effectively saying that is let x zero denote an infinite amount of information. And indeed, if everything is coded in the initial condition, 
everything is quite a lot, no? It's the entire future, infinite time. So you have to code infinite information. So it's a huge assumption to say that everything is in the initial condition. So actually mathematical real numbers are not physically real if you don't believe in infinity. Mathematical real numbers are actually physically random. And these random numbers, which would be a much better terminology instead of real numbers. Now we speak about real numbers because of Descartes for historical reasons, but a much better terminology would be random numbers. And these random numbers should be the basis of scientific determinism. No, randomness is in tension or in contradiction with determinism. Doesn't work here. So how should we think of uh, these random numbers or these real numbers? Maybe this is the intuition that we could have. You know, the first digits, they are well determined. But if you go down the series, at some point, these digits get less and less determined. They get blurred. And after some time, after some uh, position in this uh, series of digits, they get completely indeterminate. So once you have that, you may say, OK, but they are indeterminate, but I can supplement it. I can add additional information. I can add supplementary variables. This is something that people do, for instance, in, in quantum physics quite a lot. Quantum physics is indeterministic. Let's try to add additional variables, supplementary variables that often come under the name of hidden variables or hidden local variables and so on. So we could just say that instead of God playing dice when potentialities become actual, God played all dice at the initial time and coded all the infinite results in the initial condition. That is certainly a logical possibility, at least if you accept this infinite information. And so we face a choice. Either the fact that at present certain things happen and others do not is interpreted as revealing retroactively information about long past initial conditions, or else we understand the present was the result of indeterminate reality and the future is open. So here it's very important. So it's not that I'm saying that one is correct and the other one is wrong. I'm just telling there are there is a choice. Of course, now if you say I don't want infinity, then you have no choice any longer. But if you accept also classical mathematics, then you have a choice. But for sure, the choice is not forced on you. You have the choice to believe in deterministic uh, in determinism and classical mathematics or not. And for instance, if you now go back to classical mechanics, which is usually presented as a typical example of a deterministic theory, but actually the real numbers that we are using in classical uh, mathematics, or classical uh, mechanics, sorry, is real numbers, they are the hidden variable of classical mechanics. And you don't need to buy them. You can just go with intuitionistic mathematics. Now, there is a fact that almost all physicists accept real numbers without even noticing that they are supplementary variables while simultaneously rejecting Boomian positions. So Boomian positions are, is an example of hidden variables uh, that turn quantum mechanics deterministic. But here in both whether classical or quantum Mechanics, you have a choice. So whether classical mechanics is deterministic or not is not a scientific question. It depends on the physical significance one associates with mathematical real numbers. So it depends on the mathematical language. And intuitionism indeed brings classical closer to quantum. Usually my colleagues like to bring quantum closer to classical. I'm doing just precisely the opposite. Okay, there were big debates about quantum, relativity, time, and all that. Uh, these two encounters are pretty well known. This one is a bit less well known. On the left, you have David Hilbert, which I use here to illustrate classical mathematics. 
in which every real number is an individual completed entity. All digits, all these infinite digits are given at once. And the continuum is a collection of individual points. And so you can pick out one of them, one real numbers. So these real numbers, they somehow exist outside of time in some ideal Platonistic world. On the opposite side here, you have Brouwer, who I have already introduced, the father of intuitionism, uh, for whom real numbers are processes that develop in time. The digits are not all given at once, except the computable number, except the numbers that have a name or have a finite algorithm. And so the continuum is a viscous collection of processes. So I'll come back and I'll tell you what I mean here by viscous collection. Um, important here is there is also a continuum. It's not that here things get discretized. Uh, there is also a complete continuum, but the continuum in intuitionistic mathematics is very different from the, in classical mathematics. And in intuitionistic mathematics, time is essential at any instance only finite information exists. So let's look at this intuitionist mathematics. Let me give a brief uh, presentation of it. So let's start and, uh, with what Brouwer called choice sequences, alpha of n. n is an integer, one, two, three, four, and so on. And for every integer, we have a choice, an element of that choice sequence. Now the choices are made according to Brouwer by this ideal mathematician that I don't want. I want to have something more objective. So I just assume that nature has the power to produce true randomness. So to produce new information. And if you want to have a description of the passage of time, we need indeed to assume that nature has to, the power to produce new information. So I call that this natural random process and this natural random process indeed produces new information in the forms of bits. So at each time instant, uh, time step, which I call an instant labeled by an, uh, an integer, the natural random process outputs some random number, some random bit actually here. Let's, let's think of bits here. And all these bits can be used uh, as argument of a computable function in such a way that we produce the next element of the choice sequence. So the choice sequence at instant n is a function of all the information that exists at that time. But of course the information when we go to the next time step is going to increase. And so you can have that this, the value of this function changes. I'll come to examples. Let me actually jump to example. Then there is something about convergence. So let's start with the most simple example of an intuitionist number. So you have just this uh, random bit produced at instant n, and you use it as the next bit in your series. So actually this bn, the next bit is just r of n. So this is exactly what I had with my illustration before with my quantum random number generator. Here, it doesn't have to be quantum. It's just nature's power to produce new information. So these numbers are growing and gets more and more, but they are random. I call them even totally random because every bit here is random. Now the opposite example, maybe at the opposite extreme would be a computable number. So for computable number, you can also formalize that in the same way, but you would say that here, all what is needed is a finite amount of information. It only goes up to K and K is just a fixed uh, integer. And so you only use finite information. And with this finite information, you can compute any computable number. For instance, you can compute pi, we come to that, or any pseudo random series, like your computers, they all have pseudo random number generators. They use only finite information, obviously. So let's illustrate that with pi, which is probably the best known computable number. And all bits of these, of all computable numbers, in particular of pi, 
are fully determined by a finite deterministic algorithm. And it takes time to run the algorithm, but this is like my number N2. You, you know that if you want to compute one of these bits, it's going to take time, but it's only going to take a finite time. You have an algorithm, you can run it, may take some time, but you'd get it at the end. For sure you get it. Now what is even uh, okay, more interesting here is that the bits, for instance, of pi, they may look random, like also the bits of your pseudo random number generator in your computers. They look random, but they're actually hidden in the algorithm and in the seed. So the, uh, and there's an example for pi, for instance, this algorithm here allows one to compute directly the nth hexadecimal and hence also the, the bit of pi without first computing the previous bits. And this is something very surprising and I think very important to understand. Let's start with an, an example. For instance, assume that uh, whether it's going to rain at Piccadilly Circus in precisely one year from now is indeterminate. It's indeterminate, no way to know today. But of course, you can just wait a year. In a year time, it will be determined. You just see, is it raining or not? But in order to know whether it's going to rain, you have to wait a year. You cannot jump ahead. But with computable numbers, in particular with pi, if you want to know the nth hexadecimal, you can compute it straight without the need of computing first all the previous ones, all the previous bits. So the bits of pi don't come one after the other. It's not one day after the other. Here, the bits, they are already all there because I can jump ahead and directly compute it. Let's continue with another example, which I think is important for intuitionistic number, which uh, we developed together. We, we call it finite information quantities, and we developed that with uh, uh, Flavio Del Santo, my co-author in this uh, PRA um, publication. So here the next bit, see it's the next bit, is not just given by the uh, last uh, random bit produced by the natural random process. Uh, it is a majority vote over the last K ones. And because you do some majority votes, you will get some correlations between the bits. The bits will be not completely independent of each other. You know, if the majority is very large, then the next bit cannot overrule that majority. So it will have some correlations. And so this is probably pretty close to the kind of numbers one would imagine in physics, where you have first some bits which are fully determined if we are at time n, then after, Qn, bits n, you have bits which are already biased maybe because of this majority up to the n plus k minus one. And then after that, well, these ones are still totally undetermined or indeterminate. Okay, uh, one last example of an intuitionist number is the following, which is quite a, an amusing example. So this is a number, you see this uh, choice sequence oscillates around one half, can be one half plus or minus, depending whether Rn is zero or one, whether this bit is zero or one. So it oscillates around one half, uh, but it converges to one half. But we add as a rule that this choice sequence goes on until by chance the last half random bits all happen to have the same value. Okay, so maybe at some point the series terminates or the number dies, as I like to say, and then it sticks to the last value. So you have something that oscillates above, below, above, below one half, but maybe at some point it stops, it dies above or it stops below, or because the probability of termination decreases exponentially, there is an a priori probability that the sequence goes on forever. So here you see already that this number, you cannot say it is smaller than one half, 
at least as long as it didn't die. You cannot say it is larger than one half. You cannot say it is equal to one half. It is very close to one half, but it is kind of sticky, sticky around one half. Okay, this is another example which I jump. Um, okay, you go. You have also logic. Uh, for instance, the statement r of n is equal to zero is indeterminate before the nth time step. Like the weather in a year time is as today indeterminate and will remain indeterminate until a year from now. The proposition this mortal number is smaller than one half is indeterminate as long as the mortal number did not die. Okay. And so we have already said it so in intuitionist mathematics, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. And so no non-constructive existence proof exists. And if you want to prove something in this intuitionist mathematics, you have to make a constructive proof. It's not enough to prove the negation of something to prove that it is correct. It's not enough to prove uh, uh, that the negation is impossible because that would not prove um, what you want to prove. It could still be uh, indeterminate. This is very surprising. It is at least surprising to mathematicians and physicists. And it is surprising to us because we have been trained and selected to accept the law of the excluded middle. If we would not accept the law of the excluded middle, we would have failed our exams at university and probably not be here. But again, if you think of an indeterministic world, a world in which time passes, a world in which the future is open, it makes a lot of sense that things about the future in particular are not yet settled. So elements of this uh, intuitionistic continuum are evolving sequences of computable numbers. And sometimes they, uh, the sequence is still ongoing. So important here, let me again emphasize that there is a continuum in intuitionist mathematics. It's not that we discretize things, but indeed at every time step, this finite information, but this finite information is growing. Or if you want this grid of the discretization is becoming thinner and thinner and thinner. Of course, if you have an, also some dynamics, especially chaotic dynamics, then these dynamics will stretch your, your uh, phase space. And then there comes one surprising theorem, which is called Brouwer's theorem, which says the following. All total functions, so all functions defined everywhere, are continuous. They are no step functions. Why is that? Well, let's suppose you, have, you would like to define a function which is zero up to one half and one after one half. What would be the value at one half? How would you uh, put this uh, mortal number? Uh, what, what is the value of that mortal number that continuously oscillates between smaller and larger than one half. It has no value. It's impossible to put a, a, a value there. And that's why step functions are impossible in intuitionistic mathematics. And that's what is meant by saying the intuitionistic continuum is viscous, because you cannot really take out just one point and say, okay, all this one half, I take it out. And consider it special. That's the point of discontinuity. It is a bit like honey. If you have a pot of honey, you cannot take out just one molecule of honey. Honey is sticky or viscous and similar here. Okay. Um, there are other theorems that have to be changed or adapted. Maybe let, let me just say something about Gleason's theorem because it's a very important theorem in, uh, in quantum mechanics. And it was uh, noticed quite early that the standard proof of Gleason's theorem, provided by Gleason himself, is not valid intuitionistically. And that's raised then a, a debate. And this debate was then solved uh, by uh, Richman, who proved Gleason's theorem 
but in a different using a different proof technique. So some theorems are new, like that one. Some theorems are no longer valid, like the int intermediate value theorem can be replaced by something which is good enough for all practical purposes. And some theorems remain, but require a different proof technique. Arithmetics, just to say, you can also do addition, uh, compute uh, sinuses and so on, things like that. Let me maybe not go too much into the details here. So, but at the end, um, let me just again say that the, the language, mathematical language we use when speaking physics has a huge influence on the worldview that physics presents to us. With classical mathematics, we have determinism, we have no time or time is an illusion and so on. But now if we go to intuitionist mathematics and compare it with indeterministic physics. So for instance, if we believe that physics is indeterministic, it means that the past, present, and especially the future are not all given at once. Today, it is not the future is open. And this translates in intuitionistic mathematics by the fact that digits of real numbers are not all given at once. Time passes. Well, numbers are processes. Indeterminism. Numbers contain finite information. The present is thick. You know, that's probably a, a, an intuition that I share with several colleagues. Um, the present cannot be just this set of measure zero. Set of measure zero has no real existence. And the present exists without beyond any doubt, maybe less doubt from the past and the future. And indeed here in this mathematical language, the continuum is indeed viscous. So the present cannot just be picked out like that. The future is open, no law of the excluded middle. Becoming, of course, very important in, in indeterministic physics, choice sequences, experiencing, intuitionism. Okay, so here, so far so good. Let me, okay, quickly, I see that I'm going a bit over an hour, but give me maybe a couple of more minutes, if that's fine. If not, Carlo, you just jump in and tell me to shut up. No, no, no just uh, probably five minutes will be good enough. You know, what is the, the main argument that many of my colleagues are going to, to tell uh, is relativity. In relativity, uh, indeterminism is not uh, trivial to, uh, to incorporate. And there are even okay, some arguments that uh, relativity requires, implies determinism. So let me just argue here a bit about the relativity of indeterminism, which is again a paper co-authored by uh, Flavio uh, Del Santo. So let's assume that we have uh, some uh, proposition A, which is indeterminate, or some bit here, so here. The bit A is indeterminate, which means that a proposition A equals zero has no true value. Then at some point in time, so vertically I have time, or this uh, common in, in this uh, quantum uh, relativity picture, so drawing of space time, so horizontally is time, vertically, uh, no, sorry, horizontally is space, vertically is time. And so at some point, there is an event, me making a decision, or let's say more physically, just a quantum event that happens here. And then after that, of course, the bit A now is determined and the proposition A equals zero may be true or may be false depending on the value of this bit A. So here, let me just really emphasize the difference between ontology and epistemology. Um, ontologically, a determined uh, bit may be known or may be unknown. Something can exist, be determined without you knowing it. However, if it is ontologically indeterminate, then for sure you may not know it. Then for sure you don't know it. So there's only one possibility here that doesn't exist. And what I'm now going to talk is really about ontology. 
I'm not so much interested here today in epistemology. So here, when I say that A is indeterminate, I really, it's not a matter that I don't know it. It does not have a value. Okay, so now let's have a second uh, observer. So the first one I call Alice and the second one Bob, as is traditional uh, nowadays. Um, let's suppose they are at rest, at relative rest, so they don't move with respect to each other. Of course, for Bob here, it is absolutely clear that he would not know the value of A because he's outside of Alice's light cone. But what else, what, what, what we are now postulating together with Flavio del Santo is that really also ontologically, the value of A outside his future light cone is indeterminate. So we really have the following picture. A gets determinate, has a determinate value only in the future light cone. And everywhere else, it remains indeterminate. Okay, I don't go here into the details, but actually this very simple argument, which I think is super plausible and super natural in special relativity, actually rules out some of the, the main arguments by uh, put them and uh, uh, I forgot now the name of the other guy, uh, who, who um, had an argument claiming that uh, relativity implies um, determinism. But here we prove that it doesn't. Um, and then you could even have that you have a, a random number generator on Ali's side. You also have one on Bob's side. So same story on Bob's side. Um, and then you can also ask where is a proposition about the relation between bit A and bit B, for instance, A equal B uh, determined. And this one will be determined only in the intersection of the two light cones, only here. And then you can do the same for even quantum. So here you do a quantum measurement along some direction, you get some results, plus one in this example. So you collapse the state, which was a, a singlet to that state. Similarly on Bob's side, so those who understand the quantum mechanics, this is all pretty trivial. But what I'm saying now, which is non-trivial, is that it's only in the intersection of the future light cones that the complete collapse happens. Consequently, there is no wave function of the universe, which is again a big change compared to traditional classical, classical mathematics-based um, quantum cosmology. Okay, let me come to the, to the conclusion. Okay, again, mathematical language we speak when talking physics impacts our worldview. And maybe the most important conclusion is really this one. Some conclusions one is tempted to infer from physics, like determinism and the illusion of time, are actually inspired by the language, not by the facts. You can keep the facts keep the same prediction, same predictive power, but change the language and your worldview is affected. As I said, classical real numbers are the hidden variable of classical mathematics, or classical mechanics, sorry. And classical mathematics, if you think of classical mathematics from the viewpoint of intuitionism, this really assumes a view from the end of time. Of course, at the end of time, whatever that exactly means, everything has happened. So everything is determined. All the digits of all the numbers, all the events, everything has happened. But that's only at the end of time of God's eye view. So the law of the excluded middle holds only if one assumes a look from the end of time or a God's eye view. And then it's not surprising that with classical mathematics, we get a, a worldview where everything is settled because that looks at everything from the end of time once everything is settled. Intuitionism brings classical truths of the quantum and indeterminacy is relative. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and obviously I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, ba ba I don't see my chat notes. It's probably helpful if you read it because, uh, yeah, no, I probably have it onto more, but why don't you read it simply? No, 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 I, no, 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 sorry. I mean, I described pi as a computable number, so it's not a typical real number. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so maybe my, my, my okay, maybe I, I made a mistake in a, uh, but for sure pi is a computable number. That's why it has an algorithm. I even uh, showed you one. There are many algorithms that allow to compute pi, but the one I showed is this remarkable one that allows you to compute any hexadecimal or any bits without even computing the previous ones. Um, and, and indeed pi has a name. The name is pi. So uh, it is a, an exceptional one, or one that we, we name, some people say computable number or algorithmic number, uh, but it's certainly not a typical one. So if I, if I said the opposite in my, in my lecture, I'm sorry about that. I, I believe there's no known algorithm to compute the nth decimal digit of pi, which doesn't compute yeah, all the earlier okay. ones first. <laughs> Yes, okay, okay. I see that some people are <laughs> very knowledgeable. No, and, and you're absolutely correct. I mean, you can compute these hexadecimal ones, and from an hexadecimal, of course, you can get pi, or you can get bits, sorry. But it is correct that the, the, the decimal ones, there is no known algorithm. It doesn't mean that they exist none, but there is no known algorithm that allows you to compute the, uh, the nth uh, digit of pi without computing the previous ones. It's, it's pretty tricky and remarkable, uh, but you're absolutely correct. Okay, so I think Andrea was first, so please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. That was a very uh, stimulating talk. Um, I have uh, a, a, a minor curiosity. And... Oh, I think. Uh, it's, uh, Nicholas, I think, yes, that's, I think. Running out of battery. Before yeah. me. Okay, sorry, I just had to plug in my computer, the battery gets low, but it's all fine. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, when was the security at a certain point, you uh, made a, a distinction between uh, Brower and Hilbert and characterized Hilbert as uh, sort of a full Platonist thinker uh, concerning real numbers. I, I, I would, I mean, it seems odd to me to qualify Hilbert as a Platonist, uh, of course, there are different uh, parts of Hilbert. Uh, that's the idea that consistency entails existence, and then probably that would uh, uh, qualify Hilbert as a Platonist on any consistent theory. However, his, I mean, his full-blown theory uh, would be with the distinction between real finitary arithmetic and then uh, uh, mathematics and then ideal mathematics, which is uh, far from being Platonist. And so it, it just... Uh, seems to me strange to qualify uh, Hilbert as a as a as a Platonist in this sense. But uh, then I, I would like to hear your your reaction on this. But that that was just a minor a, a minor thing. Um, I have a if I can uh, maybe, maybe I'll, let me answer that, oh, yeah, and sure, then sure, we sure. come back to your to your second question. Sure. Um, so uh, first of all, I mostly agree. I mean, anyway, Hilbert cannot be summarized in in a few uh, in a few sentences. It's it's so, such a big. Uh, figure and actually Hilbert was also pretty much interested of this idea that only finite information exists. Still, I mean, he was defending uh, classical mathematics and he had also personal conflict with Brouwer, which of course is, should be irrelevant, but you know, humans are, are humans. Um, I didn't say he actually exactly that Hilbert was a Platonist, but I said that the real numbers exist in some sort of Platonistic world. And I think this is correct. So even if Hilbert was maybe not a Platonist, anyway, he was a complex pers uh, personage. Um, but these real numbers, they exist somehow in this Platonistic world. They don't exist in the real world, because for me, at least in the real world, you don't have infinities. Okay, sorry. So that was by, I thought that the, the, the blue lines were an interpretation of Hilbert's thoughts. 
So, so that was my okay. answer. I have it. <laughs> um, a, a more general question. I was uh, that, that's probably my lack of understanding. I, I, I see the uh, connection between adopting an intuitionistic mathematics on the one side, in order to match it with an uh, underdeterminate conception of reality and 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 time. I can't really understand whether this is um, a sort of a um, either aesthetical or a heuristic uh, uh, idea. So we better use a language which is uh, clearly more consonant with our understanding of physical reality, or whether there is um, a real problem in using uh, classical mathematics. So for example, I mean, uh, intuitionistic mathematics is interpretable in classical mathematics. So one could say, look, uh, mathematics is classical, uh, time is open, reality is indeterministic. I can express this indeterminacy of time and, 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 and reality uh, by using the classical mathematics. Of course, there will be consequence of classical mathematics that somehow uh, conflict of pure classical mathematics that conflict with this uh, openness and indeterminacy, but that's a problem of classical mathematics, not a problem of the way in which I describe the world. Now, clearly, there's an, under, uh, an underlying uh, assumption that I think is driving your thought uh, that um, the principle of bivalence, uh, if it holds, it holds across the board. So if it holds for mathematics, it holds for physics too. It holds for time too. And therefore, if you adopt the, the principle of bivalence somewhere, you adopt it everywhere. But I think, I mean, at least in philosophy, there are in the discussion between realists and anti-realists, there are several views in which um, you can adopt the principle of bivalence locally. So, for example, you can adopt the principle of bivalence for mathematics, but you don't adopt it for uh, ethical statements, for example. And, and so one could say, look, the principle of bivalence holds for mathematics. It doesn't hold for physics. So I can use classical mathematics. I think mathematics yeah. is classical. I can uh, interpret in classical mathematics uh, and indeterminate uh, physics. And there, in physics, the principle of bivalence doesn't hold. So I was wondering whether there is really a conflict between the two, or is just a, a more coherent picture that you are suggesting. Thanks. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, I think the answer goes also in two steps. So first of all, if you adapt classical mathematics, like okay, almost everyone is doing, it is then very tempting. And I think we are influencing also all the, the students of science, probably also in philosophy, to take it very literally. And so to conclude with uh, Sabine Hoppenfelder uh, that actually, uh, you know, science teaches us that time is an illusion, that free will is an illusion, that determinism has to be true. But I would agree with you, you can do classical mathematics and just have enough understanding or step back enough to understand that this uh, Classical mathematics does not need, no, does not necessarily imply determinism, but still, it's a. Uh, I mean, if I talk to my colleagues, uh, I guess ninety nine point nine percent would tell you, oh no, no, it has to be determinism. Just look the, the science tells you that, and actually, what they mean by that is the mathematics tells you that. So I think already it would be very nice just to to see that actually there are different mathematical languages that provide different worldview. So that, with that, I would already be very satisfied. But then indeed, I have not yet uh, shown you any example where you can do something with uh, uh, intuitionistic mathematics that you could not do with classical mathematics. Of course, here I have some examples where I would tell you, oh, it's much more natural. And maybe you buy that or maybe not, but you know, to have a real, uh, powerful example where something was found, some new physics would be found thanks to the usage or the inspiration of uh, intuitionistic mathematics, that has not yet been done. Um, and it would be very nice to do that. Uh, I'm thinking about it, but okay, it's not trivial. And anyway, even if I would find something or if someone else finds something, then there could also be a classical uh, mathematical physicist 
who shows, oh, but look, we could also do it with classical mathematics. For sure, if you can do it with intuitionistic mathematics, you can also do it with classical one. Um, but maybe if we get some good inspiration from this intuitionistic mathematics, that would be a very strong argument. So far, my strongest argument is stop telling that science imposes on us determinism. Okay, thank you. Just just uh, as a pointer, I think in uh, as a book by Stuart Shapiro called Varieties of Logic, uh, in which he makes a, a nice example between uh, uh, some sort of essential uses of intuitionistic mathematics in physics, and he mentions smooth of infinitesimal analysis uh, uh -huh. in order to claim that some of the results that you can derive in physics with smooth infinitesimal analysis, which is intuitionistic, could not be uh, derived with, with classical okay. analysis. I am, it's completely beyond my limits to understand uh -huh. whether that is true or not, but I was okay. just... <laughs> can you just maybe send me a, in, in the chat or, sure, uh, the, the reference? Sure, I will. Thank Let you. me find it now. Thanks for your answer. Uh, in the meantime. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, if you can send that reference, that'll be very helpful. Thank you. Um, so the next one is Kevin. Hi, how's my microphone? I can hear you. Great, wonderful. All good. Uh, so I'm slightly confused. This is not my question, but I'm slightly confused by what Andrea just said, because surely any intu any theorem that's true intuistic, and I don't know even how to say it, intuistically is true classically. But, but, but anyway, I, I have a technical question and a, and a broad, naive question. <laughs> uh, so the, t the technical question, let's get that out the way. Um, things like Hilbert space and, and things like ba even basic theorems about Hilbert space need things like the axiom of choice in some weak form and, and are not valid. Oh, very good. So I've got this no. wrong. <laughs> I, I no. assume. OK, go on. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So, so, so for instance, if you have a, an infinite Hilbert space, abstract Hilbert space, and you want to prove the existence of a basis of a, of a normal basis, you indeed need the axiom of choice. But if you have a, an explicit Hilbert space, for instance, the Hilbert space of the uh, all the functions uh, whose uh, square integral uh, is finite, uh, then you don't need the axiom of choice to prove the existence of a basis. You just construct a basis. So for all the Hilbert spaces that we really need in physics, they are always explicit wow. Hilbert spaces. And for these ones, we just construct the basis. We don't need an abstract existence proof, a non-constructive existence proof. Okay, well, wonderful. That's a great answer to that question. Thank you. Uh, and now here is a much more naive question. You uh, can, is it, is it absolutely out of the question that the universe is determined by a finite amount of data and God didn't roll the dice at the beginning? Because you gave us these two alternatives, either God rolls the dice at the beginning, or the dice are continually being rolled as as we play and as time goes by. Is okay. it absolutely clear that? Okay, so I think in what I said today, or with intuitionist mathematics, you cannot really prove that uh, the world is indeterministic. It's certainly, I mean, this intuitionistic mathematics is closer to my uh, experience of the passage of time maybe two years also, I don't know, but it's not a proof. Uh, so if I really would like to prove uh, indeterminism, I would actually go to Bell inequalities. And uh, there, is a, there is a real theorem that says if distances really exist, and you may challenge that, and if uh, you don't have super determinism, so if you don't, if, if they exist independent events in the, in the universe, and if you can violate a Bell inequality, but that's an experimental fact, then according to a, a precise mathematical theorem, the outcomes of the quantum measurements in this violating these Bell inequalities uh, must be random, must contain some true randomness. Uh -huh. so, so you can prove it. There must be an infinite it. amount of stuff somehow. There must be an infinite amount. There must be an infinite random sequence of zeros and ones somewhere in the system. No, 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 because it is, it, is, it is random in the sense that the probabilities cannot be just zero and ones. It is not a sequence of bits, because the sequence of bits must be infinite. But you can also have this, uh, it's more the idea that the process, uh, uh, these ah, quantum measurement processes must be random. 
But you can't maybe do infinitely many random. You can't maybe. No, you, you do only I finitely see. many measurements in your lifetime anyway. Um, uh, but uh, but but this is enough to prove the existence of non-zero and non-unit probabilities. Uh -huh. And from that, you can then prove that if you would run this well, they, process they, I mean, forever, you would, with probability one, get a sequence of bits which is incompressible now you have to define probability you have to be careful right because yeah <laughs> okay uh, okay i don't <laughs> i agree no it it, it is uh, okay but there's an entire literature also on that and and you can you can then quantify how much entropy comes out it's not maximum entropy by the way because there are correlations so there's not maximum uh, the probabilities are not one half let's say whatever but you can you can indeed uh, bounce the uh, the amount of entropy uh in function of actually the amount of violation of the Bell inequality. Uh -huh. But just to say, so this is my way of arguing in favor of physical indeterminacy would be via Bell inequalities. While here, what well, that's today, I just said there is a language, a mathematical precise language, which allows you to talk in a very natural way about indeterminacy in science. Very nice. Th thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Martin. Good morning. Uh, uh, thank you for, for a, a very nice talk. And I've, I've, I've read most of your, your papers on this topic, and, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I, I guess, you know, it comes back to me that, that, you know, the real challenge is that we only have a finite amount of information. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, through work on on cosmology and so on, I, I've you know, come to the realization that that you know almost all of the information in the universe, it, almost all of which is entropy, but I'll just treat entropy as, as information that we simply can't access. Almost all of that information is is in the the photons of the cosmic microwave background, and that's about ten to the ninetieth bits. That's so that's that's a, a finite number, but the amount of information is is steadily growing. At a small rate, uh, and uh, so time really corresponds to uh, acquisition of new information, and these are the mm -hmm. the events that that are happening. The information is not localized. In quantum theory, information is in fact global. Quantum states are global, and and so we develop a, a model of of geometry and uh, this classical representation of the world. And I think one of the big challenges in physics is that we tend to think of that as being very well defined. You know, that the, the space can be resolved to arbitrarily small distances, that time can be resolved to arbitrarily small intervals. But we don't really have the right to do that because we don't have the empirical evidence. We don't have the information that allows us to do that. So another way of, of approaching this, as opposed to going to intuition, intuitionistic mathematics, is to actually make use of the language of uh, generalized functions or, or distributions. You know, instead of using Dirac delta functions in, in all of our calculations and quantum theory and so on, use, use distributions that have finite width. Uh, so the test functions, we should actually be able to cover the entire universe with a finite set of test functions, perhaps on the order of 10 to the 90th of them, and, and the, the volume of each little test function would coincide to the entropy density or the local entropy density in the region in which we're working. And when we do experiments such as at the LHC, we, we pack an enormous amount of information and entropy into a very small volume. And that then allows us to, to probe to smaller distances because, because we actually give, def, give definition to, to the space-time geometry within that tiny little volume. Uh, and so we pack the information in. Uh, John Moffat has developed a, a finite quantum field theory based on this, this notion that, we, that you make use of, of finite distributions. And it's, everything works out finite in all the calculations. You no longer have the, the infinities, uh, you do the calculations, mm -hmm. it's all finite and uh, it resolves many of the, the challenges that we, we face in, in normal physics. So I think that, you know, this use of the real numbers with the complex numbers, but assuming 
uh, classical mathematics has actually led physics uh, you know, down a, a path that, that's, that's given us uh, all kinds of, of apparent problems, apparent paradoxes within physics that, uh, that are unnecessary because we've made assumptions about our, our underlying structure, our manifolds and, and a number system that simply aren't valid. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I can only agree so far. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's just I think that you can you can work within the classical mathematics, but use the language of distributions, and accomplish essentially the same thing as you're as you're doing with the intuitionistic mathematics. Yeah, I, I agree. Again, I mean that's uh, I agree. You you can you can do it, but you should realize that uh, you have to be careful which kind of conclusion come really from, you know, physics and which kind of conclusion come or are inspired more by the language, by the mathematics. Yes. And if you, as you just said, I mean, if you adapt it to finite information and be careful about all that, uh, that's perfectly fine with me. Good. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Martin. Um, Marcel, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I thought it was a great and really fascinating talk. Uh, I had two questions, but um, one of them has already been asked and answered by uh, your response to Andreas and uh, Martin's uh, question. Simply, simply the fact that everything you can do in intuitionism, intuitionistic mathematics, you can also do in classical mathematics. Um, and maybe just one comment on this uh, reference to smooth infinitesimal analysis that was being made. I mean, even here, uh, you can, of course, build a model for smooth infinitesimal analysis in classical mathematics, right? So the model will not be too valued. It will not obey the law of the excluded middle, but you can still do everything. Um, but I'm still very sympathetic to your um, struggle against this false ideology that a lot of physicists um, derive from classical mathematics. The derivation is, of course, not correct, but nevertheless, they, they make this. But um, I, I have one question, and this is maybe a naive question, but I was always puzzled by this when thinking about intuitionism. So when exactly is it that the indeterminate truth value turns into a determinate truth value? So assume that a mathematician proves Goldbach's conjecture tomorrow. Uh, she could have proved it yesterday, or she could prove it, well, another mathematician could prove it in 100 years, or she could uh, have a train accident and never prove it at all. Nevertheless, the fact remains that it could have been proven, right? There is a proof. And I thought you said something very um, telling in response to a question earlier. You said, uh, there is no known algorithm, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist one, right? So there, there is an algorithm that could be found, or there isn't one. So this is something that I, I never really managed to square with the intuitionistic claim that there are indeterminate truth values. I mean, even if we don't find the proof, in some sense, there's still this one, isn't there? No, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. This, this, the goal back conjecture might be true, but not provable. I mean, that is a possibility, and that's quite a good model if, for an intuition. I mean, believing that it's probably not true, but not provable, but it certainly could be. Yeah, and that's we, quite we, a good model for intuition. I don't know how to say that word. Yes, so intuition is, yes. <laughs> we, we don't know if it, if it can be proven or not, of course. That, so, that's correct. If it's yeah. false, it can be proven false, but it could, yeah. in theory, be true but not provable. In theory. And, and I'm not suggesting it's likely, but it's logically possible, and it's, and it's a good model to, re, to remind, to, to think of, if you're trying to understand intuitionistic mathematics. Mm -hmm. but, but here's what puzzles me, then, because, uh, so, assuming it is, it, it will be proven, it could have proven, been proven at a different time, and what the intuition is for, yeah. Okay, I, I think, okay, let me say two things. First, the first part of your, your, your comment and question, um, there are theorems that are correct in intuitionistic mathematics, which are simply incorrect in uh, classical mathematics. For instance, the existence of step functions. Of course, you have step functions in classical mathematics. You don't have them in intuitionistic mathematics. Um, but what is, nevertheless, in physics, you know, there is no real difference between a sharp step function, mathematically defined step function, and a, a function which just, you know, jumps very quickly, but is still absolutely continuous. There is no difference in practice. 
So that's why everything we do in physics or in science in general, biology and so on, uh, with intuitionistic mathematics, we could also do with classical mathematics and vice versa. I, I don't see yet a way to really distinguish the two. Maybe inspiration can be better with one form of mathematics, of mathematics than the other, but at the end you can do everything with the other one also. But certainly the, the mathematicians would disagree that everything correct in one mathematics is also correct in the other one because you have counterexamples. Okay, now uh, about uh, this uh, when does uh, Goldbach conjecture or anything gets really proven or disproven uh, or proven to be uh, undecidable, whatever. I agree that this is not very clear, and that's why I don't really like this, uh, the Brouwer's way of presenting intuitionism with this ideal mathematician or this creative subject. And I prefer to replace it with the idea that nature has this power to produce new information in the form of new uh, random bits. And so these random bits, they just continually get produced at every time step. Of course, I'm now discretizing time, and you may argue against that. Uh, have no good. Uh, I, I understand that this is a, a weakness, but uh, if you accept this idea that there are these time steps, then it is perfectly uh, clear that at every time step you get this additional random bit, and uh, and then you can just accumulate these random bits and use them to define. Uh, your totally random numbers or your mortal number, all these numbers that I have uh, presented as examples of intuitionistic numbers, all these choice sequences. And then it does no longer depend on, you know, whether someone has a good idea to prove a conjecture or things like that, which, okay, again, is historically the way Brouwer introduced all that, but it's certainly not the way I would like to uh, present intuitionism to... to uh, scientifically minded persons. Sorry, can I jump, jump quickly in, uh, in on this debate to, I will actually reply to Marcel. Please. Um, I, I think in order to understand intuitionism, one really has to buy the idea that there is no truth which is not epistemically constrained. And that means that being truth means being proved, actually, uh, well, probably being provable, but that that's that's controversial. So uh, uh, that someone has a proof at at her disposal. So if in your example, when you say, look, at t zero, we didn't know go whether Goldbach conjecture could be proved or not, and then at t one, we prove Goldbach conjecture. Then at t one, we know that Goldbach conjecture it is true then it means that there was an algorithm that proved the conjecture even at t0 and so that that goldbach conjectures always was true uh, from 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 the beginning even before our proof uh, there is, that meaning of that the sense of truth that you are using is is not shared by the intuitionist uh, the intuitionist will say no look being true means being proved and at t0 we didn't have a proof and we didn't know whether a proof exists, existed. So we cannot say that the Goldbach conjecture was true before T1. I'm not saying that I agree with this. I'm just saying that it's, uh, it's, I think it's one way to understand uh, what the intuitionist has in mind. So I, I think I would agree that um, intuitionistic logic is a good representation of uh, an epistemic situation. Uh, it's, it's a good way of, um, of uh, yeah, explaining how um, uh, epistemic, uh, well, an epistemic agent um, may develop through time. Um, but I, I mean, it's, I, I don't see how intuitionism has any argument against classical mathematics, uh, especially not in regard to, uh, in, in light of the fact that the classical mathematician can do everything the intuitionists can do, can build models. I think that the main argument is about finite information. Mm. So, okay, in one of my paper, I argue that in a finite volume of space, you cannot have more than a finite information. Of course, now you can argue against it, but it's a reasonable assumption that finite uh, volume of space uh, cannot contain more than finite information. And if you accept this assumption, it means that uh, 
a beard ball in this finite volume cannot have a position faithfully described by a, re by a typical real number because this typical real number would contain infinite information. And of course, this beard ball is within a finite volume of space. Okay, can I jump in here? I mean, I, I agree completely with that. And that's that's consistent with, with my view of, of this notion of, of not being able to resolve space uh, the geometry more finely than, than the information available locally that allows you to do so. I want to come back to your, your comment about your know, concern about time steps. Uh, I, my notion is basically that that acquisition of new information, each new bit you acquire, corresponds to time. So if you don't acquire new information, if you're not gaining in the world, time is not progressing. That's so, exactly my her her uh, Heraclitus time, no? Yes. This time is really the accumulation of new events. And, and, and so it's necessary that we acquire new information in order for time to exist. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to uh, propose, uh, uh, because we have maybe 10, 15 minutes left of, of discussion. So I wanted to well, ask you a question and, and then really leave it up to the, to the participants to discuss. <clears throat> because, so the way I mean, I completely, by the way, I completely agree with your view, the intuitionistic view. I think it was a very um, well put together uh, talk to, to present the, the topic. And I completely sympathize with the feeling of uh, this makes more sense in terms of how we experience things. And, and I think there's there's a good, uh, it's, it's very good to say that, it's very, uh, very correct to say that we are teaching our students a bit too biased in this direction of, you know, uh, things are the way they are and mathematically pure and, and all that stuff. But anyway, so what I was thinking is, um, it seems that in history, at least in the last 100 years or so of physics, we've, I mean, the models of classical mathematics have really inspired how we think of the universe. I mean, most of the industry in physics is now built on, you know, classic, classical mathematics in terms of manifolds and Hilbert spaces and all these kind of things. And so I have a very agnostic view on, you know, the ontology of these things and wh whether they're really, you know, existing in some platonic universe or something like that. I, I take a more sort of statistical mechanics approach, which is, okay, these things worked, we made predictions, we made t technology out of it, as you pointed out very well in your talk, and, and, and they are clearly working somehow. So my my question would be, or, and the point of discussion for everyone to, to chime in is, is, do you think this this is sort of hinting at new mathematics or new sort of way of, of doing mathematics in general that, that somehow transcends this? Because, I mean, there's been this discussion of, okay, you do this classical or this intuitionistic, and to me it feels like we're just doing something that is a little bit different than what we did before. And, and because now, I mean, clearly you can say, well, that was inspiration, but to me, the measurement was the measurement. You know, we always went down to the lab and wrote down some finite number and we communicated finite information with each other. And that's how science uh, progressed up until this point. So my general question, and I don't have any particular, I mean, I have my own thoughts, but I don't want to really spill them here. <laughs> I prefer that everyone uh, sort of chips in and, and gives their, their impressions on what, how do you envision the sort of the near future of, of mathematics in physics and science and so on uh, in this direction? Well, I mean, my, my, my view would be, uh, my, my hope is that Okay, uh, I'm not sure it's a very realistic hope, but the hope would be that uh, students get exposed not only to, I mean, physics and other science uh, students get exposed not only to classical mathematics. You know, what I regret is that I was kind of uh, convinced that there's just one mathematics. And that's simply not correct. Yeah. And I think that's that changes a lot. And for instance, this uh, this uh, YouTube video by uh, Sabine Hoffenfelder, if she would be more aware that there are these different mathematics, she couldn't just she couldn't say that. Of course, then the second dream is that maybe at some point, you know, I still think, and I think Martin, for instance, and others would agree with me, we physicists have an extraordinarily poor understanding of time. And time is so important. It cannot be, we are not going to make progress. For instance, this, okay, quantum gravity, people talk about quantum gravity to put together relativity and quantum mechanics. 
I don't think we're going to solve quantum uh, gravity if we don't gain much deeper understanding of what time is. And Martin, you can probably confirm that you agree on that. From everything I heard from you, I guess you are going to agree on that. But that, that's, you know, we need to have that. And for that, maybe we need yeah, to step a bit away from just classical ma mathematics in a, in a narrow sense. Yeah, Martin, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, I, I completely agree. Uh, actually, I mean, after my PhD, I worked in industry for 30 years, and it was only with the founding of Perimeter Institute, I, I was invited to start taking part in some discussions there on quantum gravity. Uh, and you know, that was like 18 years ago, I, I started into that. And I'm still you know, taking part in every other week, we have a dis general discussion on quantum gravity. And uh, you know, I I'm fairly open with them. I, I think that they're, they're lost. They don't really know what they're, what they're trying to do. And I think fundamentally quantum gravity is, is simply not necessary. And the reason they think they need quantum gravity is that they're assuming that there's that the the real number system is the number system to be used in physics that manifolds are you know resolvable to arbitrarily small distances and this is the the, the source of the the uh, apparent contradiction between classical theory and quantum theory uh, when you try to put them together through general relativity. So on the left-hand side of the Einstein equations, we've got classical geometry. And on the right-hand side, we have quantum matter. And you know, this is a, a, a big problem. So the quantum matter has uncertainty associated with it, but the space-time geometry has no uncertainty. And, and that's something that they can't accept. If you accept that the space-time geometry is uncertain, cannot be resolved, that it's not defined to arbitrarily small distances, uh, and this includes both space and time, uh, then you, you accept then that the classical uncertainty that with which we know the world corresponds to the, to the quantum uncertainty that, that, that we've been able to detect in all kinds of elegant experiments. Uh, and, and so I think much of this issue can, can be resolved and it comes back yeah. to you know, the, 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 the worldview that's, that people are trained in uh, that says, yeah, and this is even more surprising in uh, at Perimeter, where you have Lee Smolin, who is so much emphasizing the importance of time. Well, I, exactly, and, and I've talked with Lee regularly, and, and I used to drive him back to Toronto after you know after the, my my sessions at, at Perimeter, uh, and you know, yes, there there are some strange concepts there, but it's it's very difficult to to break through. The other person who spent a lot of time at Perimeter, and he's, he's basically retired now, uh, is uh, uh, why am I, I blank on names sometimes. It'll come back. Uh, it's Raphael Sorkin, who developed this notion of causal sets. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Now, if you look at, at the, the, the space-time diagrams that, that you put up today, two different observers, uh, who are trying to recognize events, you can generalize that and think of, okay, so what information does observer A have versus observer B? And in, the, in their common past, they have to have shared information. Otherwise, there would be an inconsistency because A would observe B in the past, but it, was, it would be observing B having different information than, than A has. And you can actually build a causal set in terms of the information held by different observers as they move along their, their world lines or as their time progresses. And, and causal sets don't need to be localized in, in terms of you know, points in space time. Causal sets are uh, a relationship between the information held by different observers or acquired by different observers about the universe. Uh, and, and generalizing it still, still further, I, I think of you know, our perception of the universe, the model that we develop of the universe in our minds is in fact uh, a representation of all of that information. And we store that information uh, in our minds as a causal set. We maintain the relations, the causal relations between all of the little bits of information that we've acquired. And uh, Raphael Sorkin's notion was, was that, well, I, I can, think of a causal set 
as a sprinkling of points onto Minkowski space, a random sprinkling of points. And so a causal set can represent Minkowski space. So the information that we've acquired and the way in which our minds store that information can also be used then to construct a Lorentzian space-time, which is the way in which we represent information. Yeah, so time is essential. Time is essential. <laughs> Right. Any other comments? Any other questions or thoughts? And by the way, very, very pleased with how the conversations are going. It's, it's very natural and very conversational, which is, of course, what we, what we intended. But otherwise, um, let's bring it to a close now. Yeah, I think we can probably draw it to a close now. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicola, Carlos, and all of you thank for you. a lively discussion. Uh, just a quick reminder that the next session will be in one hour approximately, but one hour and 10 minutes, with Karen Lee Overman presenting the talk In Search of Prehistoric Numbers, the Evidence, Methods and Issues. So I hope to see you all there. Okay. Thank you once more. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.